so lotus is one of the many auspicious symbols we have and lotus has a very very beautiful symbol a lotus flower uh, grows in mud it grows in slush but it remains the most pure thing so you can put water on it it doesn't nothing stays on it you can put anything on it nothing stays on it it remains pure and pristine so the symbolism of lotus is that uh, you know typically we tell people be like lotus you know even if there is mud all around you you should know how to flourish in that mud and stay pure and pristine so that uh, that's it that's why lotus is uh, you can find it everywhere in our sculptures in our stories even in our description of uh, the of the deity to a broader lands podcast author and blogger anu welcome to the show namaste and thank you for having me yeah namaste yeah it's an honor and privilege and i'm i'm grateful to have you to learn learn from you and um thank you guys for watching and uh i, I wanted to learn about ancient india you know cuz it's so rich mysterious mystical and and just beautiful history it's it's fast always been fascinating to me i feel like i lived there before in a, a, another life that's makes any sense uh, since i was a kid i always felt that um but that's kind of rare being mexican raised in los angeles like how do you you know how is that you know but um i wanted to uh, learn from a uh, from your point of view versus a european point of view we always hear about india uh what was it like growing up there See, I am an Indian. I was born in India, and I've lived most of my life in India. I've lived a little bit in US and UK, but most of my life I have lived in India. So for me, it's a default. You know, it's a default that you uh, uh, that you grow up here, that you grow up in a spiritual environment in your family, and you see wherever you step out, you see temples, you see people praying. We have tons of festivals. So. around the year you are surrounded by lot of festivity lot of rituals lot of traditions and lot of um stories associated with each of them so we uh, probably grow up and i think we are very very uh, fortunate to uh, take birth in this land where which is so rich and it is rich more because we've had a the longest living a cultural civilization you know the the most ancient living civilization i'm sure civilizations existed in all parts of the world ancient civilizations uh, but most of them do not continue to be uh, living their ancient culture you know the the newer cultures have taken over but india has managed to uh, stick to its old culture uh, hold on to it and uh, wherever possible nurture it and take it further so i guess it is the longest living civilization which gives us very very strong roots is india far older than we're told do you believe uh so i don't know how long you think india is old but you find uh, the evidence is keep going back so uh, the oldest civilization that we know of is a uh, popularly known as indus valley civilization we call it sindhu saraswati civilization uh which uh which was discovered about 100 100 uh, 200 years ago uh and uh, the date of it keeps going back our oldest literature which is our vedas uh, uh their dating is uh, has been done by a lot of people but every time the dates keep going back so uh, so yes it is older than that and also a way interestingly our concept of time is cyclic it's not a linear time so there is a linearity but there is a cyclicity so we also believe that the time takes turns so you keep going back and forth you know you it's cyclic so what is today will come back again it's like those fashion cycles you know so the fashion of the uh, of the last century or the last decade or three decades ago it keeps coming back and then going out of fashion similarly uh, you know we believe the time is cyclic so that um, that confuses a lot of people 
and uh, uh, so yeah it is older uh, uh, but honestly i am not too bothered about how old it is or what is the date the fact that it it continues to live is more important for me and you traveled throughout india st- looking at the beautiful temples and architecture would you like to touch on that with us okay so i uh, started traveling just like a casual traveler and then temples started attracting me and initially it was the temple architecture and the beautiful stories and the sculptures on the walls of the temples and then each sculpture had a story or each sculpture uh, went back to either our epics or our puranas or our uh, you know ancient literature it had lot of symbolism uh, it was like open air history book so i was interested in that architecture and you know again dating what period it comes from which dynasty has built it and all that stuff but as i kept visiting them i realized that temples are not just structures they are actually energy systems so i started getting more attracted to the devatas uh, or the deities who are enshrined in those temples and then i started studying the whole system of what the whole temple stands for and uh, of course i started getting narrowing down on certain types of temples uh, which is devi temples uh, that started attracting me and i started visiting them more as a devotee as a pilgrim than as a curious traveler um uh, uh, so now i i typically visit temples only when i feel like visiting and when i want to pray to a certain deity or when there is a call from that deity in fact um, a very interesting phenomena that in india we say uh, that you can visit a deity only when the deity wants you to visit him or her um so a uh, lot of those things have happened so uh, temples you can see them from multiple uh, prisms you know like i said you can look at them as mere monuments beautiful monuments grand monuments ancient structures uh you can look at them from their engineering perspective you know these are massive structures which have been standing for uh, uh, more than 1000 years um, rain and uh, sun invasions attacks everything they have seen but they still continue to inspire and all you know when you look at them you wonder how did they manage to create this you know how did they even manage to pour such huge quantities of stone uh that uh, most temples do not exist at the source of the stone um how how did they pour how did they take such heavy stones up and down so all that aspects you can look at you can look at the architecture the design you know the uh, the different parts of the temple the mandapa the garbhagriha the the natya mandap uh, the mandapas built for the rest the, the you can look at the art you can look at the paintings you can look at the sculptures uh you can look at the festivals you can look at the rituals you can look at the daily rituals you can look at the annual rituals uh you can you can study the deities you can study the stories on the walls uh, which um, which include human history as well as spiritual history royal history um uh, you know you can look at temples from a very very spiritual perspective and go there to for spiritual advancement so there are so they are like a multi dimensional microcosm of the indic civilization at some point in time they were also our banks they were our community centers they were our hospitals they were our uh, public courts they were our public places which belonged to everybody so it's like a microcosm of an ancient civilization some of them are living some of them are not living but i hope they will be living very soon What's the name of that um site? I think it's the Elora Caves. Is am I saying it right? Uh Yeah. It works. It's all one it's all built out of one rock. Yes. 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 So when you, when you have to look at engineering marvels, uh, that's like the biggest engineering marvel I have seen on earth. There are many other marvels that get celebrated, but there is no bigger marvel. There's a huge chunk of one single rock that has been carved upside down and <coughs> sorry upside down with so much precision uh, uh that even one thing going wrong could have spoiled the whole thing but it's absolute precision 
and uh, absolutely awe inspiring and to to build it top down you have to imagine that um, the architect could in could see that temple inside one rock and then uh, chip off everything that was not needed so that only the temple remains often uh, i think being in america uh, and i've been to a few churches back in the day and i would hear a pastor bring up india and it would bring up the religion and i think at times I would hear the pastor give misunderstandings, uh, misinformation uh, uh, about deities and different gods. They worship different gods. And like, like if in, like the Hinduism is like wrong. Um, and I believe that creates intolerance, religious intolerance. Um, I, I was, would love to get an ad. Um, you break down what the deities and, and the gods and, and Brahma, it all means for us that may not know? So we believe uh, that we believe in two types of worship. One is called Nirgun, uh, which means uh, the uh, the omnipresent consciousness which has no attributes, which you can't see, which you can't define by the attributes that we know. So it has no form and shape. It has no attributes, it has no properties through which you can define. So how do you define, uh, so if, if we define anything, any entity that we can see, we define it in the, in the form and shape we see it. So the ultimate reality is what we call Brahman, or there are many words which are used, but Brahman is one of the most common words used. And that reality is, it cannot be defined. It cannot be comprehended by, by the human senses. So what we do is we imagine that or we invoke that in something that we can see and that we can imagine or that we can do. So for example, I'll tell you what every country has a flag, right? Yes. What is a flag? It's a representation of that country. Just by putting a flag somewhere, you are saying that this is a representation of the country. Similarly, when we have a deity, say a Rama or a Krishna or a Durga, they are representation of that in the form and shape in which we want to worship. So, in and and the different forms are the different manifestations of that uh, ultimate reality. So, and why are there so many? Because we we can create we. We have devatas who help us in different, who have a different purpose. So a deity which is um, uh, a deity like Durga, she helps us. She's a fierce goddess. She helps us win over our enemies, both external and internal. There is Lakshmi. She is the most beautiful. She's the prosperity giving goddess. She gives you all kinds of wealth, you know, whether it's health, whether it's wealth, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's vehicles, whether it's uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, grains, you know, all kinds of prosperity she gives you. Then we have Saraswati, she gives you uh, wisdom and knowledge. She's the goddess of knowledge. So as students, we all worship Saraswati. We need her blessing. She's the goddess of speech. So people who are very good orators, we say that, you know, you have the blessings of Saraswati. So uh, these are different forms and depending on what we are pursuing in life, we pursue that data. So if I'm a student, I will invariably worship Saraswati. So in our schools, in our colleges, you'll typically see the uh, murti of a uh, murti or statue or idol as you say in English uh, of Saraswati being worshipped because you are there to pursue knowledge. When we get married, uh, when we are in an, when we are in a in the second stage of life where we are pursuing when we are earning and we need to earn and uh, cater to our family needs, we typically worship Lakshmi so that we are we, we have prosperity. So similarly, there are different deities. Uh, so the warrior clan, people who go out and fight wars, um, uh, we call them Kshatriyas, they worship Durga, um, who is the goddess of, who is a fierce goddess who helps you win over enemies. So different deities uh, serve different purpose for different people and for the same person at different stages of life. 
we invoke the deity who we need so for example hanuman is known for protecting he is known for his strength and for protecting so we worship hanuman whenever we feel uh, any kind of fear or whenever we seek protection we invoke hanuman so these are the deities and then there is something we call ishd devata so ishd devata is the devata who naturally attracts me i'm naturally attracted to a certain form of devata so i would worship that devata so that is why we have so many devatas and um, it's not that they are the cast in stone you can always create new devatas you can always create new devatas if the new needs arise so uh, it's a very very uh, uh, if i can use the modern uh, jargon it's a very very open architecture of um, you know open system architecture of uh, spirituality but we all realize that behind all these manifestations is that one uh, ultimate reality from which we have emerged just like you were saying uh, it's like the ocean wave you know so we've all emerged from the ocean as a wave we'll stay for some time and then we'll go back and merge in the ocean so that ocean remains the ultimate reality all these manifestations so are are different manifestations at different levels so for example we live for let's say 100 years as human beings we live for 100 years but devatas they probably live for a much much longer uh, period of time but their time is still finite uh, so infin infinite belongs only to the ultimate reality i hope i'm making sense to you oh you do you do and i appreciate it so the wave represents our experience the ego or the wave represents our being as being you know so the when the wave is created it's like we are taking birth the for, for few moments that it remains or is is uh, ident- identifiable as an independent wave that is our lifetime and when it merges back that's our death okay and the experiences uh, so now if you zoom into the life of that wave uh, and see what the wave is going through and uh, everything that would be experience I love what the um Zen master uh, Tikna Khan said enlightenment for the wave is the realization it is water not the wave. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that's self-realization, absolutely. right? Yes. Scriptures I uh a lot of times by the time they get to America, how much have they changed from the original source? And does it lose meaning by the time we get it translated into English? english does lose some meaning uh, i feel english as a language has very limited uh, vocabulary uh, and there are some words for which there are really no translatable uh, so when you say for example when you use the word soul for atma that's not really a translatable um, then we have sanskrit because uh, it's a very very evolved language it has it's again one of the longest living languages uh, it has uh, its words have a lot of nuanced meaning and a lot of words have cultural connotations which is uh, nearly impossible to translate so yeah a lot of those things get uh, lost but at the same time i also feel that our understanding of anything any concept any subject is dependent on um, on what we know so we always start uh, look uh, understanding or interpreted uh, interpreting things from the point of our current understanding so if my current understanding is god there is only one god and there is no other god then this concept of multiple gods is i am going to start with the notion that how can it be true so a lot of times i it's it's more to do with mental blocks or the or the mental conditioning that we are trying to understand a new concept uh, from so uh, i think it's uh, we have to uncondition ourselves and be very open to the um, to the the concepts which may not be native to us or which may not come naturally to us and it takes a lot of unlearning uh, it's not easy uh, i'm saying it in a very very easy manner it's not easy <laughs> to unlearn what you are uh, you know the native culture that you uh, are born into so it takes and i really appreciate the people who have taken the effort to come to india or learn about indian 
culture and understand the complex models and the complex uh, mm. philosophies that um, that uh, uh, that we have. So uh, it's not easy, uh, but keep your mind open, and it's not that difficult. Also. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned the word avatar. What does avatar mean? A lot of yes. times in the West, we may think of the movie Avatar. So avatar is uh, comes from a word called avataran, which means to descend down. The word itself means to descend down. So when the deities come to the earth, so in in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Shri Krishna says that whenever there is, whenever the dharma is lost. Whenever there is too much chaos in this earth, and whenever the dharma uh, a dharma becomes or becomes bigger than dhar, uh, dharma, I will descend down to do the course correction. So uh, whenever there is there is something that we humans are not able to handle, the devatas or the deities they descend down in the human form, mostly in the human form. Sometimes also in the in some other life form but mostly in the human form they descend down and they live as humans and but they do those extraordinary jobs that need to be done like mostly killing of what we call asuras which can loosely be translated to demons uh, or the negative forces so they come down to kill or uh, finish those negative forces and bring the balance back to the earth. So these people, when the higher beings, so in a simpler language, we can say when the higher beings come down on earth or descend on earth to take care of the chaos, uh, that is what is avatar. It literally means descending down. Yeah, thank you. Would you consider uh, Jesus or the Buddha avatars? Buddha, we definitely consider an avatar of Vishnu. Uh, Jesus, I have not studied, so I don't think it's it's right for me to comment. Yeah, I appreciate that. I wanted to ask you about the um, you hear about the Nagas in India. What what is that? Give us a better understanding on what the Nagas are, because I see them in ancient aliens and stuff. <laughs> so Nagas literally means serpent. It's it's more like a, a species, you know, uh, a species of reptiles uh, who are who are different forms of, uh, of forms of snakes, uh, different forms of snakes. Now their stories are found all over in our scriptures. So nagas, uh, it was almost like we could communicate with them, we could talk to them, we could fight with them. They were like humans. And there are also certain communities in India uh, which uh, claim their descent from Nagas. And Naga worship is prevalent all across India. You go to uh, any part of India, you will see these stone sculptures of snakes which are worshipped. We even have a festival called Nagapanchi. Uh, on, on, on this day, the snakes are given milk. So, uh, so it's a very, very... Uh, it's a very, very um, uh, a relationship which is of coexistence. So almost every animal uh, that uh, exists in our ecosystem, we have something to celebrate that. We have something to celebrate an interaction and interrelationship with them. Uh, but more so with Nagas, they are found everywhere. So there are stories, uh, if you read Mahabharata, which is the biggest epic and the longest ever written book in the world, uh, you'll hear, uh, you'll read a lot of stories of Nagas. But then there are stories of birds as well. There are stories of uh, elephants and horses and all kinds of animals. Yeah, I ask you that because you find that all over the world, the symbology of the Nagas, uh, whether it's in, uh, you know, uh, Mexico you know, Japan or China. I wonder if there's a connection, you know, Egypt. So I believe uh, I believe one connection that is potentially there, um, and it's, it's a guesswork, uh, is that the the snakes represent the netherworld, the underworld, the patal as we call it, you know, the, the, the world. So we assume that there are, we, if Earth is the middle, uh, middle plane, 
then there are planes with the upper planes which typically we call swargaloka or the higher realm and uh, the, and in 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 probably western uh, terminology it's the heaven which is above us and then there are worlds which are below us and those worlds that are below us they are supposed to be inhabited by nagas because they you know physically also if you see they they, they live in a hole in the earth so they go inside and live inside so i think it's something to do with them inhabiting the um, the uh, the the planes that exist beneath the earth a lot of times uh the the naga or the serpent stood for wisdom as well around different cultures the kundalini is that represent the serpent energy as well possible 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 so when you say you know this concept that whatever exists outside also exists within us mm -hmm. um so uh, that that applies to uh, the naga or the serpent as well so a lot of people connected to the kundalini shakti um, you know the the energy that goes from our the base of our spine to the top of our head somewhere here so uh, they connected to this uh, but that's more of a connection just like i'm explaining you the ocean and wave that that's how they explain the kundalini shakti using the serpentine motion so the motion of that energy it doesn't go straight like this it goes like this in a serpentine motion So they probably use that analogy. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Have you had any spiritual experiences or some kind of experiences being at these temples with all that energy, that collective energy? I think living itself is uh, is a spiritual experience in itself. You know, the fact that we are uh, breathing and living itself is a spiritual experience because. I guess when you ask that question, you are looking for an out of the world esoteric experience, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Okay, so there are uh, there are moments when you have those es esoteric experiences, like uh, you wonder how did this happen. For example, I give you a very very mundane example. So, for example, I may think of somebody in the morning and say, you know, I haven't heard of this person for a very long time, and within five minutes that person calls up. uh would you call it esoteric uh, or a coincidence it's impossible to distinguish between the two so lot of those things happen and lot of those things when you attain what we call siddhi you can make them happen so which means you have the power or the energy uh, to uh, or you have the you've learned the skill to manipulate your energy in a way that you can make things happen uh the way you want them to happen uh and how much can you make that happen is depends on your uh, on your sadhana or your siddhi you know going back to scriptures um one of the um ancient um stories is the bhagavad gita right what is that what does that mean bhagavad gita yeah okay so bhagavad gita is not an independent text it is a part of a, a larger text called mahabharat and mahabharat like i was telling you it's the biggest text it has 100000 shlokas or 100000 four liner uh, uh, four liner poems and it's one of the biggest things it said that everything that you can know in the world is is contained in it and everything uh, anything that is not in it is probably does not exist on earth so bhagavad gita is 700 shlokas out of those 100000 shlokas so 700 and this is a conversation that happens on a battle field so there is a battle between two sets of cousins for for a kingdom that they should have inherited from their uh, fathers so each one claims that the kingdom belongs to them and they have a fight over it it was like the biggest world war the world would have seen so the whole world was divided between these two cousins so every every uh, king every soldier was either on this part or or on that part and when this one of these mightiest cousins when he had to go and fight on day one of the war he gets cold feet and he says i'm not going to fight what am i going to do with the kingdom even if i win it 
if I have to tell all my cousins, all my uncles, grand uncles, relatives, friends, if I'm going to kill everybody, what am I going to do with the kingdom? So he gets cold feet and he gives up. And that is when Shri Krishna, who we consider as an avatar, he tells him the Gita to, and he tells him what is his duty. As a Kshatriya, he's supposed to fight for, for what is right and he must fight even if you have to fight your own family members. And this, in these 700 shlokas, he kind of summarizes the whole knowledge of all the Indian scriptures, all the Vedas, Upanishads, Upanishadas. He kind of, he brings uh, all of that in a gist in these 700 shlokas. So that is what is Bhagavad Gita. It literally means the song of the God. So both 700, end of the 700 uh, shlokas, this um, this warrior called Arjuna, he gets up and fights and wins the war. Uh, the war, it's a bloody war and it lasts for 18 days. There's a long, long description. And uh, uh, so that is Bhagavad Gita. So it's the essence of all the Indian wisdom uh, condensed in about 700 words. Yeah, thank you. Um... I know in the English translation, there's the I am a lot. And it kind of sounds like what Jesus is saying, you know, I am, um, but way older than Jesus. I, I just, it, it just, I feel like there's like a major universal consciousness they may have tapped into or similarities. But uh, Krishna was using the I am before Jesus, which I thought was interesting. It sounds very familiar being from the West. Sorry, I didn't get that. Krishna says, I am before Jesus. Um, yeah, um, there's a lot of the scriptures in the Gita, at least in the English translation of I am. I am the self within all creatures. Yes. Yes, he says that. I am the self within all creatures. I am this, I am that. I... So he he tries to tell you what, you know, he's everything, everyone, everywhere. Every, everything possible is he. He is the ultimate consciousness. Yes, that's what he says. But, um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not aware of the Jesus part, so I will not be able to compare. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate your answer, and I just think it's kind of um, fascinating. Um, also, uh, um, the flute, is there a symbology behind the flute that Krishna has? Flute? Yes. Uh, so, uh, I don't know about the symbology. I haven't thought about it. Uh, but flute brings out the charming part of his personality. So he is what we called, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was a complete man. So he had all the art forms um, uh, that exist in the world were his. He was the embodiment of them. So music... Uh, is a part of that. So, and his music comes from flute. And flute, uh, as you know, is one of the very basic instruments. You know, all you need is a bamboo and put some holes into it, and you can create music out of it. Mm, he was a, he was a, a cow herd. He used to go for cow uh, herding cows uh, in in Vrindavan, uh, where he grew up as a young boy. So, and that's when he used to. Uh, use his flute to manage his cows. So his cows would follow him. It said that he played the flute so well that um, all the cows, as well as all the young women, all the gopikas uh, in, in Vrindavan, uh, would just follow his flute and uh, and be attracted by his flute and they just followed him. So um, I don't know if there's more to the symbolism, but uh, that's when he used it. But once he left Vrindavan, you really don't see him. Yeah, I've always been fascinated. And like uh, the lotus flower, does that have a, a deeper meaning that um, that we don't know? Like the lotus flower, you find that a lot. What's the meaning behind that? Yeah, so lotus is one of the many auspicious symbols we have. And lotus has a very, very beautiful symbolism. Now, lotus flower uh, grows in mud. It grows in slush. But... It remains the most pure thing. So you can put water on it; it doesn't. Nothing stays on it. You can put anything on it; nothing stays on it. 
it remains pure and pristine. So the symbolism of lotus is that, uh, you know, typically we tell people be like lotus, you know, even if there is mud all around you, 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 you should know how to flourish in that mud and stay pure and pristine. So that's, uh, that's it. That's why lotus is, uh, you can find it everywhere in our sculptures, in our stories, even in our descriptions of uh, the, the deity. We call them Kamal Nayan, which means your eyes are like a lotus. We call them Kal Kamal Charan, which your feet are like a, a eye like lotus, which essentially means more, uh, both beautiful as well as uh, pure. In fact, a lot of our deities are sitting on lotus. Brahma sits on lotus, Lakshmi sits on lotus, Saraswati sits on lotus. So they uh, sit on the lotus flower because that's like the that's like you're sitting on the epitome of purity. And there's a uh... Other religions in India as well, right? Besides Hinduism? There is Jainism, there is Buddhism, there is Sikhism. Uh, these are the religions which were born in India. And then, of course, religions which were born outside Christianity, Islam, also continue to live in India. Uh, almost since the time they were born outside. But the religions which were born in India are these four religions primarily. Yeah, thank you. Um... I'm just trying to get a better understanding of India because I just, like I said, it's, I, I've, I've always been fascinated with India. So, and helping people get a better understanding of India because we're not there and uh, create a broader image, you know, versus just the narrative that we're told. So I appreciate you uh, coming on. Um, yoga, uh, what's the meaning behind yoga? Um, I know it's become popular in the West. Yoga uh, or yoga, the real word is yoga. Yoga is, is the westernized version of it. Yoga means, uh, it comes from a root yuj, uh, which means to join. So it, it actually means that, uh, so if I again take you back to the wave uh, analogy, then when the wave merges back with its original form, that's called yoga. Yoga means when you are going back to or when you are connecting back to what you originally are, that is yoga. And uh, what the, you know, in the Western world, you only see it as, uh, you know, different forms of body contortions and uh, asanas and it's only a physical part of it. In the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, which, are, which is the text on yoga, that's only a small part, you know, which is to uh, make you still, which helps you make uh, be still. The it has eight limbs. The yoga has eight limbs, and it starts with discipline, yam, niyam, dhyan, dharana. Uh, so it it starts with you know uh, being very very disciplined, doing meditation, doing a lot of other things, and going inward. And the physical body movement or the physical asanas is a very small part of it. Uh, incidentally, that has been blown out of proportion, and people think yoga is all about physical exercise. Maybe you can uh, walk us through the book. Um, I will put it in my links um, when where this is all when I upload this video, and for people that are interested in your book, and maybe you can give us a brief walkthrough of what your book's about. What what inspired you to write the book? Yeah, Lotus in the Stone is my personal journey of discovering my own roots in India. So uh, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s in India, we were pretty much uh, uh, deracinated. Uh, we didn't know much about our own roots. And it's through my travels that I started discovering and connecting back with my roots. And I discovered temples, I discovered traditions, I discovered a lot of ancient knowledge, uh, which was out there in plain sight, but we, uh, we didn't have the eyes to see it. So it is my personal journey of discovering India and also sharing what I discovered in India. Um, uh, it, it's on multiple dimensions. It's on uh, the architectural dimension. It is on the spiritual direction. It is on the common wisdom direct, uh, dimension. So it's my personal journey. It's a kind of travelogue, but it's a travelogue which helps you go, which takes you across India and helps you go inward. I usually like to ask my guests, uh, is there a difference between spirituality and religion, or is it the same thing? Religion is a vehicle uh, for you to uh, connect with your own spirituality. So religion is one of the tools or a vehicle. 
So what, uh, I mean, it, you can get into a debate on what is religion, but religion is some accepted practices that have worked uh, uh, in the past for, let's say, yeah, our ancestors or our community. So uh, if they work for them, they probably work for you too. Uh, but uh, in Indian uh, thought process, we say that uh, you, you look at what has worked and then apply it on yourself. If it works for you, accept it. If it doesn't work for you, reject it. So, uh, uh, so religion is a vehicle or, or, or a potential vehicle that you can use to uh, be more spiritual. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I love that answer. Um, you know, you, you said you lived on the West for a little bit. Do you see a difference between the Western mind and the Eastern mind? Is there like a major difference? There are many, many differences, but one of the major differences in the Eastern thought, and when I say Eastern, it includes most Eastern uh, uh, thought processes, uh, is that we believe that uh, uh, we are a minor player in the whole game, and there is a larger uh, destiny uh, or a larger force which controls a lot of other things. That's why a lot of things do not happen the way we plan them to happen, or sometimes uh, things much bigger than what we can think of happen to us. Uh, while in the Western thought, it is all about trying to control everything that you can have, you know, and, and not acknowledging the larger thought process. And that's why you have a lot, uh, uh, lot of these things which then depress you or, uh, uh, you know, dishearten you um, and, and, and put you against each other all the time. So uh, I, I think that's the basic difference that we believe that there is always a larger force and a larger um, plot of which we are a small part, while in the Western thought uh, you think that um, I am everything and I can control everything or I must or I should control everything. That's one of the basic differences other than that there are if we get into the micro details, there are a lot of things with that extent. Hope you don't mind me asking you questions on what words mean, because I'm soaking in your insights and I appreciate it. Um, another word I wanted to that become popular in the West is the karma and reincarnation. I was wondering if you would, wouldn't mind defining those of your understanding. Karma is basically your actions. Whatever action you do from your birth to your death, uh, or between the times of your birth and death is karma. So if I'm talking to you and creating a karma with you, you know, or towards you or from you, um, anything that we do adds on to. So like I say, you know, um, it's like an accounting book. We come to this life, we take birth with a karma balance from our previous life, uh, whatever they were, whether they were human births or non-human births. So we we are born with a karma balance and that karma balance actually determines where we are born, to whom we are born, what time we are born. And then through our life, we keep adding uh, debits and credits to this karma. We keep, uh, any good karma will add credits, any bad karma will add debits. And end of it, we have a closing balance with which we go to our next birth. Uh, if only you are able to make this uh, balance zero, uh, you nullify all your karmas, then you get out of the cycle of birth and death and you merge back with the ultimate reality and you don't have to go through the pain of taking birth. Well, I love that. The ultimate reality too. I love that wording. Yeah, thank you. Um, any last words? Uh, no, just, just, just do your karma, just do what is your duty, that what you should be doing, um, and, and and be happy. That's it. Just do what you should be doing. You know, don't bother about, don't bother too much about uh, too many things. Just just be a good person and uh, be happy and keep others happy. And that's it. Yeah, I appreciate that. And to clarify one thing that's um, pretty popular in the West as well is Namaste. Um, does that mean the divine in me honors the divine in you? Namaste meaning I, I go down to that ultimate reality which resides within you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. And take care. Namaste. Namaste.